So I'm sitting here editing the show, which I've now uh, finished recording, and it occurred to me that there's at least a couple of you that like to watch my show with your kids. So I'm putting this little quick uh, viewer discretion warning in here that, uh, you know, normally the show is pretty fam uh, family friendly, but this time I'm spending about a half an hour at least uh, talking about old horror movies and I'm showing clips and pictures and uh, it might be a little bit graphic. Uh, you might want to either skip this episode entirely, watch it on your own, or uh, just skip ahead because after I get done uh, talking about horror movies, uh, we're going to do a playthrough of uh, Shadowgate for uh, the NES there. So that's pretty cool. So anyway, uh, end of viewer discretion message and on with the show. C -C -Q plus. <laughs> All right, so it's been a couple weeks at least since we've done an episode of Flashback, which of course means that I have a fat stack of postcards that we have to go through. So uh, let's plow through these so we can get on to the uh, topic du jour. Uh, once again, these are in no particular order, uh, although the two on top are the two that I received, I guess, most recently. So last night I uh, live streamed. And uh, I mentioned that I was going to record this episode of Flashback today, and somebody said, no, you can't record it yet. You have to wait until my postcards get there. But uh, uh, your postcards arrived uh, just uh, last night, so uh, so we have them. So these first two come from Bo in uh, Reno, Nevada. I don't know if you couldn't decide between two postcards. Uh, hopefully you didn't want me to send you two postcards because I only sent you uh, one. But if you want another one, just let me know and I'll send you another one. So here, the first postcard there is just sort of a cityscape of Reno. That one's pretty cool. And then uh, the second one he sent here is more of a uh, gambling-themed uh, postcard. For those that you know don't know if you're watching the show from another country or something, Reno is in the state of Nevada where uh, gambling is legal. Uh, next one here comes from... Ah, this is once again I got two postcards from the same person. Uh, this one is from Derek in, um, in Wisconsin. Mauston, Wisconsin. Mauston? Uh, if you remember, Derek's the one that sent me the uh, Mega Man uh, minifigures or action figures. And uh, the first one here is uh, apparently the state prison in uh, Stillwater, Minnesota, it says here. So, um, yeah, the Minnesota State Prison. So, I don't know, that looks all right. Pretty cool, though, I think, you know. Those old school prisons are real creepy looking. They're all made of stone and whatnot. And then uh, the second one that he sent me here is uh, apparently uh, Minnesota's state bird is uh, the mosquito. Uh, that's a that's a joke, of course. He uh, he makes mention in here. He says, um, "I'm not sure you have many mosquitoes in Northern California." No, plus me, trust me, we have plenty of mosquitoes. Maybe not as many as in a more humid area, but um, like I can't go like you know at dusk or something. I can't go hang out outside without putting um, some kind of bug repellent on, or I'll get eaten alive. Uh, I don't know. We, we got all of a sudden, all the international postcards are, uh, are starting to roll in. Uh, we here, here's one we got from, uh, Philip in Camborne, Cornwall. So that's pretty cool. Cornwall is, uh, the Southwestern tip of the UK, I guess. There's like that little sort of peninsula that comes down. Uh, that, that is Cornwall. Uh, that is uh, where pasties come from, Cornish pasties. Uh, I probably ate my weight in uh, steak and ale pasties when I was in London. Uh, I didn't get a chance to really explore England too much. I would love, I feel like I could go to the UK and spend like three weeks uh, just checking out that little island. Um, I don't know, I could move there. I love it there. Uh, next one we got here is from Mike in Lake City, Florida who uh, sent us this Back to the Future, The Ride postcard from uh, Universal Studios Orlando. Uh, suggests that maybe I could do uh, a, a show about my memories of uh, Back to the Future. Um, I love that movie, man. I Every time I watch Back to the Future, I'm sad when the movie's over. That's how much I love it. And one thing, I don't, I mean, I don't remember what years these came out, but I remember that there was a pretty long period of time between the first one coming out and the second one coming out. Because at the end of the first one, it says, like, be, to be continued or something. And it, it felt like three or four years it took until the next one came out. But uh, uh, all three of those movies are awesome, in my opinion. I like them all equally. Uh, here we got yet another uh, Beatles postcard. That's pretty cool. This one is from Cody B. in Kokomo, Indiana. 
And uh, this is another uh, Rock Band uh, postcard. So, I mean, somebody else can tell me, did Rock Band come... If you bought the Beatles Rock Band, did it come with a bunch of postcards, I guess? Or was this like a pre-order thing? Uh, I have no idea, but uh, cool postcard, and of course, I love the Beatles. Uh, next here we have uh, from another Derek, different Derek, in Bremerton, Washington. Uh, just sort of this cool, I don't know, probably uh, sunset, I assume. That looks like a ferry. Maybe that's on the Puget Sound. Um, uh, yeah, Puget Sound. So that's a ferry on Puget Sound. Pretty, pretty sweet. Very nice looking there. Uh, next one, we got another one from Florida. This is from David in Winter Park, Florida. Uh, I don't really know what the story is, but it says Neon Christmas Installation. Uh, but it looks really cool. You see the neon lights there uh, bouncing off the water. Looks pretty cool. Uh, next, oh, this one just came in today. So uh, this is the second person, I think, to send us a postcard from South America. And this is from Pedro in Santiago, Chile. So check that out. So now I've gotten a few postcards from Brazil, although admittedly all from the same person. And uh, now I got something here from uh, Chile. So we got sort of northern South America and now southern South America. So uh, looks very beautiful. It says on He mentions on the postcard this was the first time in 10 years that there was snow on the ground in Santiago, Chile. Looks quite beautiful. I, I would love to visit uh, South America someday. Uh, here, uh, another international postcard. This one comes from Arto. Sorry, I don't want to butcher your name, buddy. But uh, uh, Ar I'm not even. I'm not even going to try to say the name of this town. Uh, it's from. It's Finland. Uh, most most Finnish words are not pronounceable by people who are not Finnish. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's not a. That's not a slight. It's just uh, they're really long. What can I say? Um, but Certainly, you know, this is pretty much what Finland looked like when I was there, because I was there actually right about this time of year, about, oh, five years ago or so. And, uh, you know, they obviously have, uh, the winters there are very harsh, and you don't get to hardly see the sun. But the uh, opposite side of that is that in the summer, the sun barely even sets at all, and it's very green and lush. So, a uh, beautiful country. Uh, here we've got another postcard from Oregon. This is from uh, Ignacio up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, full disclosure, Ignacio is actually my little nephew, but uh, he sent me a postcard. So uh, that's pretty sweet. And I, I sent him one back, so. Little Nacho. Uh, next we've got, oh, this one was cool. Uh, my This even uh, had my wife impressed. This is from Max in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, and he drew me a postcard. So uh, he says on the back here that his two favorite things in life are rap music and Nintendo. So he drew this to sort of combine the two. So it's uh, like the Wu-Tang Clan uh, if they were uh, Nintendo characters. So uh, that's pretty cool. You see you got uh, Yoshi there as uh, Yosh Face Killa instead of Ghost Face Killa. And uh, Old Dirty Belmont instead of Old Dirty Bastard. But... Uh, uh, that's pretty cool, you know, obviously he made it himself, and, and much like somebody else did, he sort of laminated it uh, with packing tape, so uh, pretty cool. Here we've got a postcard from uh, Oscar in Madison, Tennessee, which I think must be near Nashville, because this is a postcard from a, I think he says this is a restaurant in Nashville. Uh, yeah, postcard is from a family restaurant in Nashville. Looks pretty cool. Uh, only a couple here left. Oh, these, so these are both international. Here I got one from Norway. Check that out. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce what that says, uh, but basically what that is, that's City Hall in, uh, in Oslo. Uh, I didn't realize that, I guess Norwegian must share uh, some words or maybe it's a similar uh, uh, linguistic style to German. Because uh, in German, Rothaus is uh, like City Hall, and this is sort of Rod, Rodhaus, but Rodhus, but it's got that little dot over the A, which means you say it some different way. I don't really know, but uh, I didn't really think I was ever going to get a postcard from Norway, so that's pretty awesome. And then the last one I have here is from Mark in Vancouver, uh, up in Canada, and he just has a, you know, cityscape of Vancouver. That looks quite gorgeous, I must say. I've heard people describe Vancouver as like Seattle, but clean. Uh, I don't know how true uh, that is. I've, ha I've known some people that have gone up and visited Vancouver, and uh, they seem to think that it was pretty awesome. I haven't been there myself. 
I have been to Seattle, and Seattle's pretty nice. I mean, it's no dirtier than any other city. Um, and then, uh, for anybody that pays attention on uh, Twitter or Instagram, you'll know that a couple weeks ago, I went to San Diego. Like, I had to make a little work trip and go to San Diego. And while I was there, I picked up, you know, somebody asked me in the last Q&A, like, what are my favorite non-DC or Marvel comic books? And I mentioned EC Comics. And I ended up going to a comic book store that, unfortunately, I cannot remember the name of. But uh, I was able to pick up another one of these uh, EC um, anthologies, I guess. I don't know what you really want to call it. It's the first six issues uh, of Shock Suspense Stories. And uh, these are really nice because they're on, like, glossy paper. And they seem like they've been recolored. I don't know. They look really, really good. And uh, Shock Suspend Stories is a little bit different than, like, the Tales from the Crypt, Haunt of Fear type of things. These aren't generally so much scary. I would say the closest thing I could compare these two would be, like, uh, an episode of The Twilight Zone. Where, you know, maybe things are happening and it's a little bit weird, and at the end there's, like, a twist. Uh, you know, some sort of ironic twist happens, you know. So they're just sort of like... Uh, like it says, I mean, they're like suspenseful stories, you know, but, uh, uh, pretty cool. And, you know, I just love these kind of, uh, these kind of comics. And, you know, as I mentioned before, like, uh, tales from the crypt and whatnot, I, I you know, I loved reading those when I was a kid and, um, that kind of leads us into the conversation, uh, for today. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, I, I don't know if this is like unique to boys or, or well also to men really. Uh, but you know, when we were kids, we were always like trying to test our limits, you know, whether physically or mentally, you know, like, like your mom would say like, don't touch that. It's hot. And what's the first thing you would do? You go touch it. Right. Cause you want to, you want to see for yourself. Well, is it too hot for me? Or is my mom just like assuming, you know, or like, you know, we were always like ghost riding our bikes or, you know, we'd go up on a tall bridge and kind of lean over. Like, it's like we were trying to like scare ourselves or trying to test our limits. Part of that and that feeling of always wanting to like test yourself or feel the exhilaration uh, of being sort of scared for whatever reason uh, is watching like really scary movies or scary TV shows. And thinking thinking back about that, I, I you know I was really thinking that the 1980s were, in my opinion, and somebody else tell me I'm wrong, were really the golden age of horror movies. Uh, not to say that's when they started, and of course they still make horror movies today, but, I mean, you know, I read this article just today on the internet, it was like the top 10, no, top 100, uh, horror movies of the 80s, and that's just the top 100, that, that's like almost one per month, uh, coming out, and, uh, you know, normally I don't take notes, uh, when I'm doing this show, because I'm supposed to be just sort of speaking off the cuff, but, uh, uh, I, I did make a little list of uh, a bunch of the movies that came out or important figures in uh, like 80s horror. Now, for me, I would say that my first experience with like a horror movie or a horror short film uh, was actually uh, the music video for Michael Jackson's Thriller. Now, you might be thinking, well, gee, Chris, that's not really that much of a horror movie. But first, uh, that came out in early 1983, so I was like five turning six, and uh, there's a lot of parts uh, of that video that are actually pretty darn scary, uh, you know, where, you know, it kind of starts off, uh, you know, where it's sort of the movie within the movie, you know, and, and, you know, Michael's walking with his date, who I found out the actress that played his date was a Playboy Playmate, so didn't know that. Uh, and you know, he all of a sudden turns into like this weird, weird cat. He wasn't like a weird wolf. He was like a weird cat. Is that a thing? And that was pretty scary. Like, cause it shows him like morphing into this thing and he starts like growling and he's got these big fangs. And when you're five, I was like, Whoa, that's pretty scary. You know, but then you kind of get through that and then the music video starts, but you know, then the zombies all show up and then Michael turns into a zombie and it gets like scary again. So like when I was a kid, like that was pretty scary. Now, as an aside, uh, I will say Michael Jackson's Thriller, in my opinion, greatest pop song ever created. Tell me I'm wrong. One of the great things about horror movies was taking a date to a horror movie. And I got to do that uh, just once, actually. I took a date. Her idea, by the way, I, I, uh, I had to go to a wedding 
And so I asked out this girl at work and she said, oh yeah, you know, and so we went to this wedding and the wedding was just kind of boring and we didn't know anybody. So, you know, we kind of agreed like, hey, let's get out of here. You know, what we want to do, let's go to the movies. And, uh, was there, was, was there a movie called Bride of Chucky? Am I making that up? Was it, I'm pretty sure I saw Bride of Chucky with her, uh, that night. You know, when you, when you take a girl out and it's like your first date or whatever, you know, what are you doing? You're sitting there, you're, maybe you're watching the movie, but at the same time you're like, well, can I hold her hand? Can I put my arm around her? Like, you know, it's very awkward, right? It doesn't have to be. You just took her to a horror movie because what's going to happen? Like as soon as Jason pulls that knife out and starts slicing up teenagers, she's going to get scared. And what's she going to do? She's going to grab you. And at that point, it's rude not to put your arm around her. So that just gets that awkwardness uh, out of the way immediately. And uh, I think that's really, you know, part of the reason that these horror movies were so popular in the 80s was they were great date movies. And... um when we think about all the great horror movies of the 1980s, the first place my mind goes is to Stephen King because he really was, uh, no pun intended, the king of 80s horror movies uh, just because so many of his novels and his short stories were adapted uh, for the big screen and also for made-for-TV movies. Uh, I don't know how many screenplays he actually wrote. I know he wrote the screenplay for Creepshow, but I don't know how many others he wrote screenplays for. I mean, it was mostly other people were taking his work and uh, adapting it. But I, I made sort of an abbreviated list uh, of some great Stephen King horror movies of the 80s. You know, of course, first you had The Shining with Jack Nicholson. You know, here's Johnny. Uh, Creepshow, which I just mentioned, Creepshow. So Stephen King wrote Creepshow. And then uh, George Romero, who I'll, who I'll talk about in a minute, actually directed it. And Creepshow was probably the first feature-length uh, horror movie that I ever saw. Creepshow obviously was heavily influenced by things like Tales from the Crypt. Creepshow is like three or four like short stories put together into a full-length movie. And uh, my dad actually rented that when I was... I don't know when Creepshow came out. Early 80s, though. Like maybe 83, 82, 84... And uh, my dad rented it, and we watched it together. And I was a little bit freaked out, but, I mean, Creepshow is really not too bad. Uh, and it's very cartoony, to be honest. Uh, the one that always gets me, even to this day, really grosses me out, is I think it was the last story in the movie was was the guy that was like a neat freak and a germaphobe. And, um, you know, he had the bug spray, and he kept spraying the bug spray all over his, his apartment. And uh, eventually he kind of dies because it turns out all these bugs were like inside of him and his skin's like ripping apart and the bugs are coming. That freaked me out a little bit. But uh, it's also a cool movie. I mean, it's got some recognizable actors in it. It's got uh, Ted Danson and uh, uh, Leslie Nielsen. I think Hal Holbrook was in that movie as well. Uh, cool movie. Creepshow 2, actually, I also liked. Uh, now, Creepshow 2 uh, was based on short stories of Stephen King's, but he didn't have any direct involvement uh, in the movie. Creepshow 2, not as good as the original Creepshow, but uh, I still thought a couple of, uh, of the stories in that were, were pretty cool. Uh, he also, of course, did uh, Cujo. Uh, Cujo was a Stephen King novel. That was the rabid St. Bernard. Uh, Children of the Corn. I haven't seen Children of the Corn, but... You know, when I look at all these movie titles, what it takes me back to is going into the video rental store uh, anytime in the 80s because there was the whole section uh, of horror movies. I can still picture it, you know, now, like thinking of all of those little VHS tapes, you know, with, with the covers on them, like, you know, Creepshow and, and Children of the Corn and the, the Amityville Horror. You know, I used to always get fixated, oh, Amityville Horror, because to me, Amityville is uh, Jaws, you know, because Jaws takes place on this little island of Amityville. And, uh, of course, the Amityville and Amityville horror is uh, Amityville uh, on Long Island, uh, not far from, I think, where Bithead 1000 lives. Uh, what else? Uh, Firestarter. Firestarter had uh, Drew Barrymore in it. Uh, that was the first movie I remember seeing uh, her in after E.T., although I'm not saying it's the next movie she made. I'm really not sure. Uh, Cat's Eye. Uh, that was another collection of short stories. Uh, I think I mentioned Cat's Eye the other day on social media. I don't know. Nobody seemed to be into Cat's Eye. Or maybe it was on a live stream. I don't remember which. That was, remember the little, uh, that was Drew Barrymore too, right? Wasn't it? In one of the stories? I think. And it had that little uh, troll that would come out of the wall. 
and it would come up into her bed and it was trying to steal her breath. Uh, yeah, anyway. And then the cat chased it away because I think the, the cat in Cat's Eye was in like all three or four of the stories or whatever. Uh, Silver Bullet, uh, that was the, the werewolf movie. Uh, Maximum Overdrive, I remember that one. That That's the one that had sort of the possessed uh, 18-wheeler truck. Uh, I saw that movie. For a little while, we had HBO, my dad. My dad got cable, and we had HBO for a while, and I remember seeing Maximum Overdrive. And then after that, uh, I wasn't too keen on semi-trucks. I always kind of wondered, I don't know if you guys remember, in uh, Beavis and Butthead, uh, there was this one episode where they were watching TV and they were watching a show called Death Truck. And I always wondered if that was based on uh, on Maximum Overdrive. And still to this day, I'll see trucks coming, you know. Like if I'm driving out and there's a truck coming the other way, I'll tell my wife, like, oh, it's Death Truck. Uh, what else we got here? Oh, Pet Cemetery. Uh, Pet Cemetery was an awesome movie. And that one starred uh, Dale Midkiff, who uh, was also in uh, Time Tracks, which is one of my favorite TV shows. Uh, as a teenager, oh, and then I wrote down Creep Show too. So I guess that's about the end of that. Uh, but you know, I, I brought up uh, Romero. You know, Romero, George Romero didn't really make that many movies. But you know, what he's famous for really is Night of the Living Dead, which came out in the late '60s, but really uh, started the whole uh, uh, zombie genre. You know, all of the subsequent uh, of the Living Dead movies, like Return of the Living Dead, I, I don't believe he had any involvement. Uh, in and then of course he also did Monkey Shines. You guys remember Monkey Shines? It had that little um, on the movie poster was that little wind up monkey with the little symbols. I think I had one of those too. That one creeped me out. Uh, that one I think that in that movie wasn't. I think the main character was a guy who was like a paraplegic or a quadriplegic and like somehow he had like this companion monkey that went crazy or something. Uh, that's like the nature of these cheesy '80s horror movies. Like they were all kind of cheesy, but you got the same thing out of all of them. They just scared you, you know. Uh, oh, Clive Barker, you know, Clive Barker did the Hellraiser movies. I've never seen the Hellraiser movies, any of them. Uh, they had, you know, Pinhead in them, the guy with all the, well, he had all the pins in his head. Uh, and then I wrote down some randos here as well. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, you got to talk about uh, two of the big, like the three biggest uh, horror movie franchises that I can think of in the 80s were uh, Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street. And the oldest of those three franchises is uh, Halloween. I think the first Halloween came out in like 79. Uh, you know, and that had the kid who, you know, he had been in like a mental institution and he grew up and turned into a psycho killer. Although I think when he was a kid, he got sent to a mental institution because he was a psycho killer. But, you know, he had the mask, you know, that he wore that rubber mask that he pulled over his face, which I read was uh, a William Shatner mask from Star Trek and they just took all the paint off the mask. And, but... uh I think that's really the the first time. I mean, I guess maybe Leatherface uh, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but uh, I feel like Michael Myers from from Halloween kind of popularized the mask. And then I think it was the next year, it was like eighty or maybe eighty one, that uh, Friday the Thirteenth uh, got started. I don't remember who created that. It wasn't anybody noteworthy that I can, that I can think of. And of course, the main character there was uh, Jason Voorhees, who you know famously wore that hockey mask. And I think it's funny because I think now, unless you're a hockey fan who's maybe at least in your 50s, I think the main thing that you associate that mask with is Friday the 13th. Because uh, as long as I've been watching hockey, they weren't wearing those masks anymore. But um, but those were all awesome movies, right? You know, they always took place up in the forest. Uh, you know, of course, Jason was sort of the... I don't know, he was like the resurrected or, or reanimated uh, body of a kid that had drowned in the lake. And so, you know, now he went around and he would kill all the kids that would stay up at the uh, uh, up at the camp, you know. And it would always be something where like, you know, some, you know, these two 17 year olds like wandered off and found some like abandoned barn. And they were like all making out, you know, and she's like, oh, no, I don't want to. And he's like, oh, come on, baby. And then the whole time there's like this little first person view and like heavy breathing coming up the stairs and like the ch -ch 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 -ch. and you just know what's coming, you know, but it still scares you because then all of a sudden it's like, you know, Jason like jumps out. Well, you never really got to see Jason that often, you know, mostly it was like from his view. And then all of a sudden the girl would pop up and start screaming her head off. And, you know, he'd, he'd kill them, both of them with a knife or whatever, you know, but I don't know. So cheesy now, but back then they were so cool. I saw uh, Friday the 13th Part 7 in the movie theater. That one came out in like, eh, 88 maybe? I, it was, yeah, 
Friday the 13th Part 7. It's called like The New Blood or something. And uh, that was the first rated R movie that I ever saw in the movie theater without having like an adult with me. Like my friend and I just went down there and saw it. Like I, it was a movie theater where like nobody cared. And uh, so they let us go in. And um, so yeah, it's Friday the 13th, Halloween. Uh, Amityville Horror, I already mentioned. Amityville Horror, supposedly based on a true story. Uh, it's an actual house that's still in Amityville, Long Island, that I guess like six people got brutally murdered and then the house sat there for years and then like this couple bought it. And they move in and there's like demons and things talking to them and, you know, the walls are bleeding or, or whatever. I don't, you know, obviously I don't know if that's true. It kind of seems like probably it isn't. But, uh, you know, if if you can say that a horror movie is like based on a true story, like it, immediately now it's ten times scarier, you know. So that makes it awesome. Uh, you can't talk about horror movies without bringing up the Evil Dead. Uh, I didn't see the Evil Dead until I was in college because my roommate in college was really into horror movies. Uh, he was also really into Resident Evil, and so I don't know if his interest in Resident Evil got him into horror movies or if the re reverse was true. Uh, he was like a Resident Evil like addict, and um, yeah, I mean, Evil Dead, Evil Dead's a little over the top even for me. You know, it, I mean, it got pretty graphic, although it's it's still a little bit on the cheesy side. Cool movie though, uh, Poltergeist. Main thing I remember about Poltergeist is uh, the little girl had that clown in her room, like a little, you know, clown doll. My sister had the exact same clown doll. So like once I saw Poltergeist, I didn't want to go in my sister's room anymore. So I guess maybe that worked out for her. Uh, I wrote down the Lost Boys. I think the Lost Boys is classified as a horror movie. I'm just not sure. I think it's a horror movie. I think it's an awesome movie. I love that movie. But uh, is it a horror movie? Maybe, maybe it's more of a thriller. Death by stereo. To me, that movie's not scary enough to to classify as horror. I wrote it down anyway. Uh, and then here I've also got The Fly. Uh, that's another movie I saw when I was a kid. Like, my dad rented The Fly. We watched that one. Really more disturbing than, like, scary. Like, a lot of these movies really, uh, it wasn't so much the imagery that was scary as that they would startle you. You know, like I said, you had the ch 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 And then, like, all of a sudden, like, the slasher dude would like jump out of the closet or whatever. And the music would, you know, dun -dun -dun, you know, or whatever. And, and then you, you know, ah, you know, uh, but you know, some of these movies, they were more scary by being like disturbing rather than just trying to like startle you. And so you could make that analogy with like the resident evil series where like the first resident evil did things like have you walking down that hallway. And then like all of a sudden those dogs come jumping out and that, you know, that scares you out of your pants. Whereas, uh, as the Resident Evil series, uh, mature or whatever, like, uh, like I bought Resident Evil four, uh, shortly after it came out. In fact, I bought a GameCube just so I could play Resident Evil four. And, um, that didn't rely nearly as much on trying to startle you. Uh, it was just more like disturbing. And, uh, I don't know if I've told this story before, but, um, I used to only play that game at night and I would turn off all the lights so that the only light was like the glow of the TV. And then I would always play it while wearing headphones just to have like the maximum amount of immersion. And then I would play that game for as long as I could take it. And then I would like wuss out and uh, have to stop playing. Um, and then I guess the last thing I wanted to mention here as far as movies go uh, was just Wes Craven. Wes Craven was also a big name in uh, 80s movies. Wes Craven is probably best known as the creator of Nightmare on Elm Street. And, uh, you know, that had uh, Freddy Krueger. You know, everybody thought Freddy Krueger was... He had that, you know, that striped red sweater and that fedora. And then, obviously, he had that glove with the big blades in it, which seems like a ripoff of Wolverine, kind of, with his adamantian claws. But but who cares? And, um, you know, that movie was, was scary, you know, sort of frightening with the startling kind of thing, but it was also a little bit disturbing. Uh, and sort of the little hook about... Uh, about Nightmare on Elm Street that made it different was that Freddy came and got you in your sleep. So, you know, you'd watch that and then, like, you didn't want to go to sleep, right? Because, like, I mean, did Freddy even exist in the real world or did he just murder you in your... I haven't seen a Nightmare on Elm Street movie uh, in a very long time, so I don't quite remember the setup. I just remember them being extremely scary. Um, I also wrote down here, uh, Wes Craven did uh, The Serpent and the Rainbow. Uh, I never saw Serpent and the Rainbow. I just That was one of those I remember always seeing that uh, VHS tape. 
uh, at the uh, rental store. Same with uh, the, the the people under the stairs. You know, I'm also I'm leaving out a lot of other movies. I mean, I you know you could spend hours talking about '80s horror movies. You know, stuff like The Thing or uh, Basket Case or I mean, you go on and on and on. Uh, oh, but but getting back to Wes Craven, so I, I kind of wanted to use Wes Craven to like wrap up uh, talking about uh, movies in particular um, because Wes Craven did the Scream series, which was like late '90s and then a little bit like I think the last Scream came out in like 2001, 2002. Um, cause to me, I think those movies were kind of the very end of, uh, the campy, cheesy, uh, genre of horror movies. It was almost like self satirical, you know, it's like you had done everything you could do with that particular subgenre, and all that was really left was for it to make fun of itself. And I feel like that's kind of what Scream did. So, uh, it doesn't mean they're not cool movies, but I think really that was kind of the end of that style of horror movie. And, um, you know, I don't watch horror movies anymore, uh, just cause now you have stuff like saw and hostile and uh, human centipede. And for me, at least like they're just sick. And, you know, I, I think part of the reason for that is that there's just no like subtlety or nuance left in like popular media, whether it's TV shows or, or movies or music. If you know, if you want to watch a movie that that's got subtlety to it, you have to go watch like art house flicks now, because like anything that's going to be like a superhero movie or a comedy movie or a horror movie that's going to get a wide theatrical release is not going to have any nuance to it at all. It's going to be like in your face, you know. It's just going to be like vulgar humor or like you know the superhero movies are just over the top everything. Or the horror movies are just like, you know, something next to a snuff film. And um, it's really kind of sad. Like, I mean, I feel like by saying that, I make it seem like I'm really conservative or something. And I'm not. Like, I don't mind uh, watching those kinds of, like, comedy movies where it's just obviously very vulgar. It doesn't mean it's not funny, but at the same time, it's almost, like, easy. You know, I think it's a lot easier to write that kind of humor than to do, like, a really witty comedy movie which we also had tons of in the 80s, and I could spend an hour talking about those. Um, but I guess it kind of bothers me just because it's like, well, then where do you go from there? Like, you can't, you can only be so vulgar, or you can only be so violent, and then and then what are you going to do anymore? It's like you've, you've desensitized people to the point where they're not going to appreciate uh, any of that anymore. And... You know, saying that, I'll also say there were plenty of horror movies in the 80s that that were more disturbing, you know, like Cannibal Holocaust or something. Um, or really Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and that one's from the 70s, isn't it? I mean, that movie was pretty messed up. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm going with that, except just saying it's kind of sad that that genre really died off. Because it was the kind of horror movie that was just fun, and you could go out and sit in the movie theater and get scared for a couple hours take a date with you and and that's kind of gone I think and that that's kind of too bad and uh I also want to talk about a few TV shows uh because for me at least when I was a kid like I loved being scared even though it would have a lasting impact on me that was probably not good like I would have to watch scary TV shows and then later I couldn't sleep or I didn't want to be like on the far side of the house by myself or something because I would get freaked out and the three uh TV shows that I wrote down. The first, uh, Tales from the Dark Side. Uh, that was another uh, George Romero uh, production. Tales from the Dark Side was like a one-hour TV show that was on for several seasons. And uh, was really more reminiscent, again, of like Tales from the Crypt or um, or one of the Creep Show movies where like, you know, each, uh, each episode was its own little thing. It was its own little story that, you know, usually had some twist ending and was maybe sort of, you know, as much horror as you could have on TV. It's the kind of thing that would be on later at night so that you could get away with showing that on broadcast television. Um, a big one for me that, you know, didn't really present itself on the surface as being a, a scary TV show, but I think we all watched it to get scared, is uh, Unsolved Mysteries. And a big part of, of that was Robert Stack's voice. Man, I would kill for that guy's voice. Sharon Stevens found her long-lost foster parents. Uh, even to this day, because uh, I think the first season of Unsolved Mysteries is on, like, Amazon Prime or Netflix or Hulu. It's on. It's up there somewhere. 
And I mean, it's the original first season. And uh, I put that on now, and like my wife overhears that that spooky music, and then hears Robert Stack's voice, and she's like, "Oh, get that away from me," because it's still scary. And uh, that was a TV show that I used to watch every week. Uh, whatever night of the week it was on was the night of the week that I spent at my grandma's house, and so she would watch it uh, with me. And you know, even like the there'd be like stories and unsolved mysteries that really weren't scary. Like, I mean, some of them were just like ghost stories, and of course, those are scary. But there were some that were just like, oh, this person is missing. Like, I don't, no one knows what happened. Like, she got on a train and went someplace and no one's seen her in like 10 years. But, but they would make it scary. It was like Robert Stack's voice and like that background music. And you'd just be like, oh, you know. And, um, that would kind of mess me up because, uh, I think I mentioned that at that time I was kind of old enough that my mom could leave me at home. So generally, uh, she worked two nights a week. The, the one night I would go to my grandma's house, the other night I would stay home alone and like I'd be home alone and it would be pitch dark outside and the theater of the mind would start going and I would get so freaked out. I could not wait for her to get home. Um, and then the third one I wrote down, or I guess fourth one is, uh, I don't know how many of you remember, uh, this TV show It was called sightings and that was on in the early nineties on Fox. Uh, it's amazing how far Fox has come. Like, you know, a lot of like the the sitcoms or or the hour long dramas that were on Fox's primetime schedule back then were like a little bit different than what you would see on the other networks, or be like a little bit low budget, or or they did stuff like this uh, this sightings. And um, I remember sightings got started. I think it was in '91, and there was this TV show. It was called like sightings the ufo report and like they like presented it like it was like news and it had like some guy that seemed like he was like a news anchor and like but the whole thing was talking about like ufo stories you know which that scared me because then of course i'm afraid that you know i'm gonna get kidnapped by aliens because they would talk about that you know this person got kidnapped like four times and they did medical experiments on him you know and so like that would scare the crap out of me and then I don't know if that that show was like real successful and it was just based off of that. But then they turned sightings into a weekly TV show. And I mean, it was just, you know, UFO stories and ghost stories, you know, hauntings like, oh, that used to get me going like hauntings. I would always be out in the living room by myself. And uh, normally it was fine. you know, I didn't care. But then I'd, I'd be out there watching sightings by myself. And we had like this big sliding glass door. Uh, that looked out over the backyard, but we didn't really have lights in the backyard. And so like, it would be pitch black out there. And again, the theater of the mind would start going and it's like, oh, there could be ghosts out there. There could be kidnappers out there. There could be aliens coming out there. And of course, you know, rationally and logically, you know, that's not true. But like, here I am watching Unsolved Mysteries and I'm watching sightings, still renting horror movies. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's probably pretty common. I think that most of us, when we were kids, you just love being scared because it gives you, when you're scared, you get that adrenaline rush. So part of that also is uh, scary video games, being scared by video games. Now, back then in like the late 80s and early 90s, there weren't too many really scary video games. I mean, they, they tried, uh, even going back to the Atari 2600. But really, I mean, how scary? Those games were not immersive enough that they could be scary, you know. Or you had like uh, the Alone in the Dark series on the PC. Those were pretty scary. But uh, the, the first game that I remember playing that to me was like legit scary was uh, Shadowgate. I actually planned on covering this game uh, last year. I was going to cover it on Halloween, actually. I thought it'd be cool to do like a little playthrough and story time really talking about a, a topic like this uh, on Halloween. And I didn't realize that Shadowgate actually came out a little bit later than I had uh, originally assumed. Um, it says, uh, 1989 on here, but I think it came out in like late 1989. Uh, for some reason in my head, I thought it had come out in, uh, in 88. And at that time, my intention was actually to play this on computer for you guys. Uh, cause this game actually came out on the Apple II GS. And so I thought just to shake things up a little bit, like, oh, it'd be cool to play it on the two GS. And so I got my two GS hooked up and I played it. And that game is really not scary. Like, it doesn't have any music, and that was a big part of what makes this game scary. So uh, so we're not going to play it on the 2GS. We're just going to play it on the Nintendo. But um, So this is not a game that I had when I was a kid. This is another game that Jonathan got, and uh, I watched him play it uh, over at his house. 
And of course that was after school. So it was still like daytime. And so it made it like less scary, but it was still, um, it's just, the game's got a lot of atmosphere and the, the music is pretty creepy. Uh, obviously the graphics are better, uh, on the Nintendo than the Apple two GS, at least for this game. I guess I shouldn't say that because there's a lot of, uh, really good looking Apple two GS games that look better than, um, than Nintendo, but Shadowgate is not an example of that. So, um, I used to watch him play it, but then I know at some point he let me borrow it and I took it home and played it and I waited and, and played it at night like you should. And, uh, so I got a little bit extra scared. So, uh, so what I figure we're going to do now is, uh, let's go ahead and load this game up and, uh, play through some Shadowgate for the NES. All right, so uh, here we've got uh, Shadowgate that we are going to try to do a complete playthrough of. Um, as you can see here, if you don't watch my live streams, I've got this new uh, OBS layout that I set up that I think looks pretty cool uh, anyway. And uh, But we're playing a creepy game today, so uh, to keep sort of the spirit of that going, uh, we're going to turn the lights down uh, a little bit. So I have to reach over the mic here. Oh yeah. See? Alright, now we've got it nice and dark. We've just got the glow of the TV there. Um, I feel like the little picture-in-picture, picture, it looks brighter in here uh, than it is. It's not very bright. So, uh, anyway, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hoping that we can plow through this game in less than an hour. So, uh, I've only got one free spot here on, uh, on the memory. So we'll pick that, file three. And uh, now it's gonna tell you a bunch of stuff that, uh, you know, to set up the plot. Uh, all you really need to know is uh, there are some good guys that sent you into uh, Castle Shadowgate here to kill a bad guy before he destroys the world. I mean, that's the, that's the plot to about half the games that we played uh, when we were kids. So uh, we're just gonna skip through most of this. Uh, it's really nothing useful. Sometimes some of the dialogue in this game actually helps you by giving you clues so you know uh, how to beat the game because some of the um, some of the solutions to some of the puzzles are are very much non-obvious but um, if you uh, if you pay close attention to the clues it gives you it, it really kind of gives you hints to get you going in the right direction so um, you know anybody who's not familiar with these games they all have the same layout um, these were these, uh, Mac Venture games was the, um, I guess the company that, uh, uh, put the games out. Let's just get started so I can do this while I'm talking. The first thing we gotta do, we gotta open this little skull thing up here because there's a key hiding in there. So, um, then we have to take the key. You can really tell this game was meant for a, uh, mouse interface. Uh, but it, it plays okay with the, um, with the controller. It's not so horrible. Uh, but there were these Mac Venture games that, you know, perhaps predictably were for the Macintosh. Uh, so the original version of um, Shadowgate was actually black and white. But uh, this game also came out for um, other uh, systems or, or home computer uh, home computer systems. And then it was in color. And I think, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned it in the intro or not. But uh, this game did come out for the Apple II GS, and that was the version that I actually wanted to play. Uh, so you got these two little evil eyes that just popped up in case you missed them. And, you know, now basically it's just the uh, the warlock that you're sent here to kill is just going to talk some smack. And, of course, tell you that you're going to die because you're trying to to defeat him. So, uh, so first thing we have to do in here is we have to take these uh, torches. You can never have enough torches in this game, so torches in this game kind of act like a timer. Uh, and I think it's basically based on how often you switch rooms. I'm not 100% positive about that. But, um, the torches slowly go out. If the torch goes out and you're in pitch black, uh, you basically die. So, uh, that way the game sort of has a timer to it. Now, the first thing we have to do here is go straight. Kind of annoyingly, the game makes you, uh, open doors before you can go through them. So we need to use the key here that we got out of the skull to uh, open this door, but uh, before we go through it, we are actually going to go into this little, what looks like a broom closet. Is it gonna make me open? Yeah, you see, you have to open the door first. It's really irritating. You can use this little mini map to, to open and close things and to move around, which is kind of nice. The door is locked. 
Wasn't that what the key was for? Or is no, that key in the next room? Yeah, that key's in the next room. Sorry. See, I'm a little bit rusty. So we have to move uh, forward into the next room. And then... Um, so I mentioned that this game is creepy, right? So it's got the kind of creepy music. Uh, sometimes it gets even creepier. But what's also creepy is the way you die. Like, there's certain things, like certain things this game will say when you die, or certain things the game just says over the course of the game that really make me wonder how the game made it past Nintendo of America's sensors. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like when you die, uh, let's save our game real quick. And then uh, I'll show you what you can do to die. So, like, there's this little uh, book here on this, I don't know, pedestal or shelf or whatever. And you have to open it, but your first inclination might just be to take it. But if you take it... You see that you set off a little booby trap, and then you get this death music that was also kind of creepy. But then watch this Grim Reaper that shows up. So, I mean, to me, if you're 11 and you're playing this game in the dark and you see that, that can be a little bit disconcerting. But all we have to do is hit continue. And for whatever reason, it sets you back one room, but uh, big deal. So we'll go ahead and move into the next room. And so now what we need to do, uh, well, first, firstly, we need to take the torches. And then you need to just open the book rather than picking it up. And what we're gonna find inside the book is a key hidden in it. So now you have to go up to take the key and then we can back up real quick. So now you back up into this room we were just in. Now we use that key on the broom closet, and that opens that. So then we go in there, and there are a couple of key items that we're gonna need later. Uh, it says you can see a sword and a sling, so we're gonna, we have to take the sword, take the sling, Sometimes this gets a little bit fussy, where if you don't have the little finger in the right spot, uh, you know, it'll say, oh, you can't take that because it thinks you're trying to take the wall or something, which is irritating. So now we have to go back in the room that we were just in. And this one, you can kind of see there's that little stone in the corner there that's a different color, this one right here, than the rest of the stones. And that's just sort of to give you a hint that if you hit it, Pow, it reminds me of like, uh, you know, the old Batman live action thing with Adam West. If you hit it, now we reveal a secret passage, so isn't that exciting? So now we're going to move into the secret passage. And then you've got two more torches here, and you might think that you need to take those, but it actually won't let you take the torches, as you can't take it. But what we can take is this arrow back here, which we're going to need to murder somebody later. But instead what you can do if you do use the torch is you move it down like that and oh, we have another secret door. So you can imagine, ooh, so that music that you hear now is like a warning that your torch is going to burn out. So all you have to do for that is you go to use and highlight an another torch and now we have two torches, one almost burned out and one burning brightly, so uh, isn't that nice. So now we're gonna go ahead and move through the little secret passageway that we just opened up, and uh, now we have these two, yeah, 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 yeah. Screams of the Undead, that sounds pretty horrible. Uh, I mean, it goes into, you know, little descriptive detail about stuff, which is, which is really cool. Uh, so now we're gonna go, we can't go down the rickety bridge right now, because that'll just, there's about 90 different ways to die in this game, so if we go across the rickety bridge, that's just gonna be yet another way to die. But we go in here, and we have this very scary wraith standing in our way, that's pretty scary too. But we can kill the wraith. You notice up here in your inventory, you have one torch that is separate from the, normally when you pick up torches, it, where it says torch equals two, It'll just say torch equals three or four or whatever. Uh, but this other torch is separate. And I, don't, I guess I don't really know how you would have figured this out on your own. But by lighting that torch, uh, it burns with a strange white flame. And uh, you scream and throw the flaming torch at the wraith. And that kills the wraith. So uh, that's very convenient. So yeah. Now we go down and we can take 
Uh, well, firstly, we have two more torches here we can take. Oh, see, there we go. See, it's not quite on the torch, so it got mad at me, so. And then we can also take this cloak that is hanging up here. And then I don't remember, if, can we go through this door yet, or is there nothing in there? Of course, you have to open it first. I don't remember if it's time to go through there yet. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can do this now. Okay. Small stone chamber, line on one side by two barred portals. I don't know what the point of those is, but uh, there's a bunch of crap in here that we're going to take. Here is another torch. Whoops. And then there's a bunch of stuff here on the shelf. We got a scroll. Now, scrolls teach you uh, magical spells. So after you get the scroll, you have to open the scroll. We took the bottle number one there, but I don't think you use bottle number one for anything. And then we take bottle number two. And then we have to read this sign that says Epor. Sign reads Epor, yeah. And then and then for the reason you have to read it again. And then uh, Epor, Epor. Oh, it seems to be some kind of magic word. And so now you just learned the spell Epor. Which Epor, of course, uh, is just rope backwards. And then uh, not coincidentally, there is a uh, coiled up length of rope and uh, directly above it is a trap door. So I wonder what's gonna happen here. Well, you've seen some strange things in your life, but boy, you've never seen this. And uh, the rope moves and uh, goes up into the trap door. So uh, that's something. And uh, I think the last thing we can do here, if you, you can kind of barely make out the outline of a door back here. And uh, we can go ahead and open that door Although there's not really any reason to go through that door yet. But we're going to come back and uh, go through uh, that door. So now we're going to back out of here. We're going to back out of here. We're going to back out of here. And we're going to... Oh, we're backing out again. Uh, to this room. And now instead of uh, squeezing through that little tiny opening, uh, now we're just going to make a right here at the end of the hallway. And now we're down here in this uh, hallway with three doors. So the first door we're gonna go into is the right-hand door. And we go in here, you're gonna see some some crazy stuff. There is, oh, sorry. There's an underground lake with a shark swimming in it and a skeleton like just suspended over the water. Well, that's pretty creepy too. Uh, there's nothing we can really do about that uh, quite yet. So right now we are just gonna, oh, I keep forgetting to open the doors. Uh, I guess it's hard to do the concentrate and also talk to you guys, but it's okay. Now the door's open, now we can go through the door. And uh, now we've got this uh, underground waterfall and we have some rocks on the ground. Now if you remember, we just picked up a sling and of course, what do you put in a sling? You put rocks in a sling. So uh, we don't really need very many of them like in fact I think we just need one but uh, that's okay now if you try to move uh, it's gonna try to move you up the staircase that's over here but of course you can't go up the staircase so if I go like that uh, it says the way is blocked by a landslide and uh, as hard as you try you can't clear the rock so you might think you know if you were just playing this game and you didn't know what you were doing like you're playing this game for the first time you might think oh I have to figure out how to clear the way there but but really it's just um, a distraction you can't go that way but you notice there's this little black area here to the side of the waterfall and we can actually go into the waterfall and uh, the walls of course are too close for comfort you guys ever watch that show too close for comfort I used to watch that when I was a kid with uh, Ted Knight and Jim J Bullock uh, anyway uh, the damp walls of the eerie cavern are rough and irregular and then you also see this weird little uh, protrusion up on the wall here, and we hit that. Then we get the little pow again. And uh, then it falls apart, and there's a bag sitting up there. So if we open that bag, we're gonna find some good stuff. Bag contains three large jewels. Well, isn't, isn't that nice? So now we're gonna, we have to take all three of the jewels. Uh, you know, I should mention, uh, that uh, a couple few years ago, uh, somebody actually did a remake of this game. And 
uh, I don't know the name of the company, I don't remember, but you can buy it like on Steam. And uh, I don't have it or anything, but uh, but I did just sort of uh, check out a gameplay video. So now we're done getting the stones out of the bag, so now he's got back out of here. And uh, I watched a gameplay video, and uh, I mean the game is still very similar as far as like a lot of the puzzles are still the same uh, puzzles, but you know the graphics are are very much updated, and uh, they look they look pretty darn cool. So okay, so now uh, I think if I remember correctly, we are going to go into the left door. Let's see what's over here. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're gonna take two more torches. You notice that there is a trap door looking thing on the ground. And uh, if I remember correctly, that's just like yet another way to die. But what we can do, see there's that little hole in the wall right there. And what we wanna do there, uh, let me go ahead and light another torch because it's gonna start complaining anytime now. Um, what we wanna do there, is put one of the jewels in there. We need the white one, if I remember correctly. So what we want to use that on? We want to use it on this little hole. Oh, see. The gem fits perfectly. And a small crystal sphere magically appears on the stand. Well, that's good, because we happen to need a magical crystal. So uh, that's quite the coincidence. Now we got the sphere. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to open this door and move through it and for whatever reason this is actually one of my favorite rooms in the game I don't know why I just think it's funny so so here you can see there's some pretty uh, it's hot in the room it says there's some menacing eyes in the dark in the back of the room and uh, there's all this stuff uh, on the floor and we want to pick up all that stuff but uh, this is kind of one of those situations where you're just gonna learn by dying if you don't know what to do uh, because you have to pick up the shield first, and, and you'll see why as I pick up the shield. So I have the shield, and then, oh, there's some kind of fire-breathing thing. We'll assume a dragon uh, in there, and then you raise your shield just in time to block the dragon flame. So if you had picked up anything else instead of the shield first, uh, you would be dead right now. And then we're going to pick up the other three items, which are the helmet, the hammer, and the spear. Uh, whether or not we need the helmet uh, is not for certain later. There's a there's a point later in the game where uh, you may or may not need some of your items. But uh, the hammer and the spear, uh, we definitely need. Uh, and every time he raises the shields, oh, it's getting hot. I don't know how much longer I can stand it. But uh, I think you're limited to picking up three things. Like I, I, I'm not positive and I'm not going to try, but I think that if I try to pick up that torch or open that chest... Uh, I think I might be killed. So, but we don't need anything else in this room anyway, so... Uh, now we're gonna back out of here. Room stinks of rotten meat, that's disgusting. Uh, now we're gonna back out of this room. And now... We're gonna go back... To the underground lake... With the shark, and the skeleton... Who walks on water like Jesus. Uh, so, yeah, supernatural erosion, that's great. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take that sphere that we uh, picked up and we're going to throw it in the water. And isn't that a thing where I'm not really sure why you would know to do that? Maybe there was a, a, a clue somewhere that I didn't know about or something. But you drop the sphere in the lake and all of a sudden the lake freezes. Wow, look at that. So now we can just take the key uh, out of the skeleton's hand. So thanks, sucker. And then, uh, now you might think, oh, well, I'm done. Now I can leave. But no, this is something else that you'd find out the hard way. Now we have to melt the lake. So we're going to use our torch on the lake. So you put the burning torch close to it and uh, it melts the entire lake. That's crazy. But only for a minute. The torch melts away the ice over the sphere, allowing it to float to the surface. And then, as you might expect, the lake quickly refreezes because the the sphere is still in it. But now we can pick the sphere up because we're not we're not done with that yet. But now we got the key, so that's important. So now we can back out of here 
And we need to, there's one thing I always forget to go grab, so let's do that now if I can find it. Go back in here, cold air from the thing, yeah, yeah. Go in here, chasm, walk through there, stone archway opens into a small chamber. Uh, this room's very cold again. I don't know why it always... I guess it's trying to give you a little clue. So now we're back in the Epor room here. So we need to go through the little door in the back here. And uh, cold water from the limestone drips on your neck, sending shivers down your spine. And you can see there's another little uh, hole in the floor. So we need to put another gem in that hole. And if I remember correctly, that is the blue gem. As you place the blue gem in the hole, you hear the sound of grinding stone. The wall slowly rises to reveal a magical image of an old wizard. And then the wizard gives you a little uh, pep talk, but he's also giving you some clues. So, uh, the warlock can only be defeated by your courage and the staff of ages. So we need to find or make, or both, the staff of ages. Says, remember, five to find, three for the staff, one to be the key, and one to be thy pathway. So I, I guess ideally, if you're playing this game through for the first time, you'd write this stuff down. And uh, then he he leaves, but now there's a scroll on the floor. So we're gonna take that scroll. Scroll two is So now we are going to leave this room, never to return. And which way are we going now? I think we're gonna go up the rope. We go up the rope, and now we're in a room full of mirrors. Reminds you of the fun house at King Otto's fair. Yeah, that King Otto was a fun-loving guy. So now, uh, we got two more torches that we're gonna grab off the wall. And this broom is chilling out over here because we may or may not need the broom later. And then a couple other things we're going to do. So first, we need to break one of these mirrors. That's why you have to have the hammer. So if you try to hit one of these mirrors, if I remember correctly, uh, I think you end up cutting your hand open and bleeding to death. So uh, bellowing like a Norse god. You smash the hammer into the mirror and you break it. I also don't remember what happens if you try to smash the other two mirrors. I could swear one of them has a monster behind it or something. So uh, we're going to go through that door but not yet. So we're gonna back out this way. So now instead of going back down the hatch, we kind of went out the door behind us here. So we got some coffins, and we need to just open one of the coffins. If you open the wrong coffin, like this green ooze comes out, and uh, it blocks the way, and then you can't go that way anymore. This is just sort of a shortcut, so there's a different way you can just go. So that one's not like a game ender or anything, but... Um, but this is the only coffin that we needed to open, so why would you open any of the others? So now I'm just trying to find uh, one to light another torch before this one uh, blows out. Torch is lit. And then we need to use our torch, because you see there was this mummy in the coffin. And of course, what do you do when you see a mummy? Well, you burn them. So he bursts into flames, leaving behind a scepter among the ashes. Well, we could probably use this. Like, if I was walking through a, a castle and I found a scepter, uh, I would take it. So we gotta get the pointer in the right spot there. Okay, now we got it. Got the scepter. So now we're gonna go back the way we were, and then we need to unlock, if I remember correctly, that door, and that's probably key number three. Yep. Okay, click the key, worked, and it unlocked the door. So now we're gonna move through the door, and whoa, look at this, it's like a bridge going across the room, and of course there's flames underneath. This room is incredibly hot. This must be with the lower levels of, I don't know what Jehenna is, or like, uh, the heat is so bad we have to turn back, so that sucks. So now we're back in the room where we were. So that is because, with all of my yammering, I forgot to put on the cloak that we got. You remember the, uh, the, the the ghost, I forgot what they called the little ghost skeleton person uh, that we burned to death. What do you want to use the cloak on? Well, we want to use the cloak on ourself. You try on the cloak and what a coincidence. It's very becoming, uh, oh, it's very unbecoming, but it barely fits over your armor. So, oh well, not a good look. So 
now we're going to go back into that room. And you'll see that now we're sweating profusely, but we can stay in the room. So, but, so now we're going to try to open the door on the other side of the bridge there. But, uh, oh no, we feel a gust of wind. And what the heck is that thing? A searing blast of heat knocks you across the room. And you can see that there's this, uh, whatever this monkey business guy is over here. So now, remember we have the sphere that, uh, freezes things. So we're going to take the sphere and use sphere. What do you want to use it on? We're going to use it on the flame. You hurl the sphere in the fire below. Apparently you don't scream like a Norse god. And uh, the hell spawn flames quickly vanish as soon as the sphere touches them. And with nothing to feed on, uh, the fire drake immediately follows suit. So now everybody's gone. Uh, so that's better for us. Now we're going to go through this room. And now we're in yet another room with a bridge. A uh, sharp cold wind whips up over the ledge of the deep dark chasm. And now we're going to move across this bridge, but oh, here comes this uh, troll coming out with, of course, his hand out. Because he says, this bridge is mine, and basically, uh, he wants us to pay him a gold coin. Now, we don't have a gold coin, so uh, obviously we can't pay him. But uh, what we do have is a spear. So instead, we are just going to stab him. Because every time in life that somebody asks you to give them money, you stab them. Troll falls silently into the dark cavern. You listen, but you don't hear him crash. So he falls down a bottomless pit. Now we move through this room, and now we're out in the backyard. Uh, you see the music change there. Now we're outside. The moon casts a brilliant shadow over the grounds of the courtyard. But what it doesn't mention is a cyclops that is just sitting over here. And, uh, you know, what is the mythological story or... Uh, I don't know, what are the, is that out of the Bible or is that out of Greek mythology? I don't remember. Uh, how do we kill a Cyclops? Uh, well, with the sling, isn't that how, uh, or was that how David slew Goliath? Was Goliath the Cyclops? I don't know. All right, anyway, so we have some stones, so we need to use the stone. And then we have to find the sling. There's the sling. So now it says you put the small stone in the sling. So now we have to use the sling. So use sling. What do you want to use the sling on? Well, obviously I want to use the sling on Cyclops over here. As soon as you start twirling the sling, a magical influence takes over your body. You cry out, death to the Philistine. What does that even mean? And release the stone, bullseye. So now that now the, the Cyclops is on his back, now you're thinking, okay, I'm good to go, right? If you try to go past that Cyclops, you'll find that you only knocked him unconscious and he will murder you. So what you have to do now is take your sword and go deliver the coup de gras. And this is one of these times where I'm saying that, you know, I'm surprised how graphic this is uh, and, and that Nintendo of America was okay with it. So we drive the sword deep into the Cyclops, blood pours out of the wound and onto the grass. I mean, that's awesome. I just wouldn't have expected uh, that to be in a, a Nintendo game. So now, while we're here, we need to use the crank on this well. Crank turns easily, that's nice. At the end of the rope is a small bucket. So now we have to, for whatever reason, open the bucket. I don't know why you can't just look in the bucket, but... Open the bucket, the bucket's open, and you can see over on the top right there that there's a gauntlet in, uh, in the bucket. So we're gonna take the gauntlet, and then we might as well just go ahead and put on the gauntlet. What do you want to use the gauntlet on? We want to use it on ourselves. Place the gauntlet on your hand. It feels like it was made for you. Well, that's better than the cloak, which was unbecoming. So now we can go ahead and move forward. The door is open. So now we can go through the door. And now I'm in this little corridor. Long drafty hallway with a flight of stairs and some other passages. Well, that's nice. So now, first thing we're going to do, of course, is we're going to take the torch. And then we're going to move into the first room. And you can see now we're in some sort of little library here. And there's plenty of stuff to look at. And then there's another hole, once again, in the wall. And we just happen to have uh, one jewel left. 
So that's probably going to go in there. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take the map, which we may or may not need later. And you'll see, you'll see why I keep saying that. And we take the skull off the wall for the same reason. Uh, you can see there's this desk sort of in the foreground here. So we're going to open the desk. And uh, now we have all this other cool stuff in the desk. So we'll take the glasses. We'll take key number five. And we will take the two scrolls. Okay. Now we have to put on the glasses, and you'll see why in a second. Glasses, glasses, glasses. Glasses. Use the glasses on ourself. They fit perfectly, and you can see very well. Well, that's nice. So now we're going to open this big tome sitting on the desk here. The book is open. Wow, so if I had tried to read the book without the glasses, it would have said something about how you can't read it. But with the glasses, we can understand and read what we could not before. So that's why it's saying the thing about uh, what you could not do before. So the light grows faint, the path winds round, where life is lost, wisdom is found, the seed of the dream, blah, 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 blah. Uh, although this is actually more uh, clues that you might need um, to get through the game. And then this Motari Ryza thing is, uh, that's another spell. So you've learned one magic spell. Uh, speaking of that though, uh, and see now the book is gone, we haven't actually opened any of these scrolls. And at some point that needs to get done, so we might as well just do it now. While fittingly we're in the library, so uh, our hands are sweating because we're so excited, wow. Uh, lands under the heavens, the key to the world, uh, Terra Tarak. So this again is stuff you kind of maybe wanted to write down because uh, what it's telling you is a clue of when to use the spell. Can I learn that spell? Uh, that scroll vanished. Now we'll open scroll four. Uh, you read the scroll. Uh, to move the sun from far to near, light is what the darkness fears. So now we have Instantum Illumina. So now we learn that magic spell, and yeah, 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 that one disappeared too. And then I think we have one more scroll, yeah, scroll two there. And that one says, as the shadow of the wind, thou shalt be humana. All right, great. Now we're gonna go ahead and uh, use that last gem. We can find it, red gem, there it is on this little hole here. And you can actually read some of those books, but I don't I don't remember if it if it said anything useful or not. So now we go through here. Now we're in uh, another room. This room is dominated by a large fireplace set in a red brick wall. So uh, there's a couple things in here we can take. We can take this stove poker. And we can take this bellows. And I think we can even take this cup up here. Yep, cup is in hand. And then now, if you look at this globey thing over here, globe mounted on the stand for display, shows all the known lands. Looking closely, you see a seam along the equator. Well, it wouldn't just be telling you that for no reason, right? So if, uh, if you remember one of the spells that we learned said something about being the key to the world, and I think that was this Terra Tarak one, and the spell was chanted. Oh, a large crack appears around the equator of the globe. So now we can probably open the globe. So open it, globe is open. And wow, there's bottle number five and more importantly, perhaps key number five. Take the bottle. If I remember correctly, I think you only use one, uh, one bottle. And I realize I keep saying if I remember correctly. Okay, now we can back out of here. And uh, now we can back out of here. Long drafty hallway, yeah, we already know about that. So now we're gonna go in the second door. And now we're in a laboratory, uh, I guess. Smells like a kennel in here. And there are no windows through which to circulate fresh air. So uh, there's a few things in here uh, that we can take. Uh, there's a horseshoe. Uh, bottle number four. Uh, looks like you can't take whatever that little... Oh, no, bottle number two. And, uh... Can we grab this little thing here? Test tube is in hand. Uh, you, I don't think you can take this big green thing. 
Yeah. But if you notice, again, we have this little stone here that is sort of discolored and has what looks like a hook or a handle on it. So if we use that, the stone rises slowly out of the floor. A shining vial is inside. Well, that might come in handy later. Who knows? So take that, and then uh, you can hear from the music changing that we are going to need to uh, use a torch real fast. There we go. And, you know, just because I'm getting uh, distracted talking, I'm just going to save the game so that in case we die, we just start off where we... I don't remember if when you die you continue where you left off or not, but let's not figure that out the hard way. So now we're going to continue on through this room, and we end up outside again. Uh, we're standing in a small garden. Only sound is a falling water in the night. You see we have this little fountain uh, in front of us, and apparently the fountain has, like, acid in it or something uh, instead of uh, water. You know, I realize this game is a lot creepier if you die more often, because there's just so many, like, macabre ways for, uh, for you to die in this game. But, you know, because I pretty much know how to get through it, uh, we're avoiding all those deaths. So, uh, you remember we got that um, gauntlet out of the well and put it on. And uh, what that allows us to do is to take this flute here out of the water. Uh, because it acts like a glove, you know. So it says by using the silver gauntlet, you can remove the flute easily. Sound of the water splashing, music to your ears, well that's nice. And I guess, I don't know if it's telling you that it's music to your ears uh, as like a little uh, hint, but what you're supposed to do here is play the flute. Uh, sound of the flute is pretty, sorry I realize I just talked over the sound of the flute. But uh, uh, you wake from a dream only to find a hole in the tree. Well that's pretty crazy. Uh, so now we can take what was in the hole in the tree, which is a ring. Uh, so that's pretty good. So now we're going to go ahead and go back. And we can go back again. And I think now we just go ahead and move forward. Open that door. And move through it. And now we're in this hallway with a bunch of locked doors. So I always forget which keys open which door. So just bear with me, I guess, uh, while I figure that out. The first thing we have to do is uh, obviously burn this rug because one of the keys is underneath the rug. There it is. So now we're going to take that key. Key four is in hand. And, uh... Am I forgetting to do something? No. No, not yet. Okay. Uh, so now we have to try to figure out uh, which keys open which doors. Alright, key four, open that one. And then I think uh, key six... Is that a five or a six? I don't even know. Oh, good. That was five. And then I think we need six for the other one. Where is it? Oh, never mind. That was six. This is five. And I think we used that. Yeah. And then the one thing we have to take in this room is this mirror over here, which again, we might need later, we might not. So now we are going to move through this door first. And then there's this crazy thing. What is this? Oh, it's a sphinx. Uh, he looks at you indifferently. It's just pretty creepy. He has too much of a human face. I don't care for that. So anyway, uh, we're going to try to move up the stairs. But uh, he's not going to let us. But uh, one thing I wanted to point out. You see there's that pattern on the steps themselves. The little, It's like three lines uh, up and then it goes like this. And then like this and then like that. Uh, that's going to be important uh, for later. I don't think you can take the the um, torches off the walls in here. So we try to move up and the, the Sphinx is like, uh, well, who, you know, who the heck are you? No one can pass without my permission. And then he's going to ask us a, uh, we have to answer a riddle. And so that's why when I was saying we're picking up all these things that uh, we don't know if we're going to use later or not. Uh, it's because it depends on the answer to his riddle. So he says, I'm a fire's friend, my body swells with wind, with my nose I blow, how the embers glow. So, uh, do, you, do you know the answer? Bring me the answer to my riddle, and uh, I'll let you pass. So, uh, you know, what he's talking about is one of the things that you've picked up. So in this case, it's the bellows, but sometimes the answer is the mirror, 
Uh, I think one time I played it and the answer was the broom. So it's a matter of just keeping all those things because you don't know which, which riddle he's going to ask because the game, like, uh, randomizes it. So we use the bellows on the Sphinx, and he says, oh, you got the answer correct, and so now you can go ahead and pass. So now we can move up the stairs. Now, a uh, telescope is beside the window. We got a star map on the wall. Uh, yeah, pretty obviously this is an observatory. Uh, this is another area where, if I'm being honest, I think there's there's some things in here that seem very non-obvious. Obviously, we take the scroll uh, off of the table. Then you actually have to take the star off of this poster here. And, um... Which I wouldn't have thought. But then, on top of that, we have to actually open the, the, the star map, which seems extremely strange. And then you see there's uh, this little purple thing uh, hiding behind it. And I have to grab that too. Uh, that's the rod. So we're going to use the rod here uh, pretty soon. So now we're going to go up the ladder. Up onto the, the... Oh no, that isn't the roof. Uh, you're so captivated by this woman's beauty that you momentarily forget her predicament. And then you see she's got uh, what looks like a boat motor or something. Uh, or the blade off of one uh, next to her. And uh, in the moonlight, she's even more beautiful. Uh, but if you try to uh, help her or do anything, uh, she will murder you. So uh, we have to murder her first. So what do you murder chicks with? You murder chicks with arrows. So we get the arrow here and stab her with it. Your aim is true as you plunge the silver arrow into the beautiful woman. And then, oh my God, she turns into a wolf. That's crazy. So uh, it's a good thing we killed her. So now we need, now we can take. So if we had tried to take this thing without killing her, she would have killed us. So now we have the blade in hand. So that's going to definitely come in handy later. Now we're done in this room, uh, and we're done in this room. I don't know if you can. It'd be kind of cool if you could look through the telescope or something. So if I hit look and telescope, you peer through the telescope. You're amazed by the clarity of the night sky. Well, that's pretty. Cool. Uh, it'd be cooler if it actually showed it to you, but whatever. So now we're done in that room, uh, where we don't need to talk to the Sphinx anymore. Uh, large banquet hall. Now we're going to go into the other upstairs room. And uh, though the evening air is cool, the small circuit room radiates a fervent heat. This game's really into temperature. Uh, so you see we've got this like horn looking thing uh, on the ground, so we're going to take that. Oh my goodness, what is that? So, uh, this large fireball suddenly appears in the room and causes you to shield your eyes. When you open them, you notice that the fire is changed into something far more menacing. And we have this hellhound here. So, uh, again, I'm not really sure how you would know to do this. You have to take the water. This is the water that you got, uh, when you lifted up that little stone in that laboratory. You throw the water at the hellhound. Oh, it was holy water. Well, see, they never tell you it's holy water. I don't think they did. Uh, sends the hellhound back to the place where it was spawned. So uh, he's gone now. So that's good. Flame dies out. Room is quiet. Now we can take uh, the horn. Horn is in hand. And then now we can go ahead and move uh, up the ladder. Now we're on the roof. I got confused. As you stand on the turret, an eerie blue dragon appears in the clear starry sky. Well, that's very unfortunate. Uh, now, you've got this little talisman here, but if you try to take it with that dragon there, you'd imagine what's probably going to happen. So we have to kill the dragon, and uh, I don't know, you know, again, maybe it was in the clues somewhere in the game. You kill the dragon with the star, so I don't, I don't know how you should know to do that. But uh, you use the star on the dragon. The star becomes a flash of light as you launch it. Look at that. Boom. Strikes the wyvern and explodes into a million pieces. So now we can go ahead and take the talisman, which we are definitely going to need later. Now we're done on this screen, so we're going to back out. We're also done on this screen, so we're going to back out. I don't know why it's calling those torches braziers. That's not what I thought a brazier was. Uh, it's a large banquet hall. So now we're going to go into the downstairs door. So now we're in this little hallway. 
Then for some reason in here, the music like perks up, which I think is kind of odd. Uh, I mean, that's okay. Uh, so firstly, we've got a couple of torches here on the walls that we want to take. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's good. And let's let's just go ahead and light one right now while we're thinking about it. So that I don't. Oh, it was already on the right page. We have nine torches. That's pretty good. Now we have eight. So then we're gonna go ahead and move to the left hand door. And now we're outside. And I don't know, the, the weather seemed nice when we were uh, outside just a minute ago, but now all of a sudden it's uh, it's windy and there's uh, uh, lightning. Uh, before we do anything on this screen though, we're gonna go down these steps to the left. Uh, there's some more lightning. And uh, there's a lookout point here. And uh, there's a bag over here. I don't know what this thing is supposed to be. Uh, it's a pot of gold. Wow. See, it's kind of funny because it's almost like you should know that you're going to get punished for your greed if uh, if you try to take that pot of gold. So uh, I think if you take the pot of gold, I think you get hit by lightning. So we don't want to take the pot of gold. So instead, we're going to open this bag. And... We're gonna take everything that's in it. So we got, we want the big coin. And uh, I don't think you actually really, you need one gold coin, I think. But if you take two gold coins, I, I wanna say you can use one of the gold coins to pay off that troll. Cause we're gonna have to go across that bridge one more time. But uh, you also can get past the troll another way. I don't know how the troll is back. I guess it's a new troll cause you killed the troll. So it's a balcony. And, you know, there's lightning, and then you see there's this little hole over here, uh, you know, on the wall. So what we do there is we need the rod, because the rod is actually a lightning rod. There's rod. Put that in the hole. Oh, move down a little bit. There you go. What are you doing? Come on. Is it not? Oh, it's not selected. Okay. Sorry about that. In the hole. Ah, there we go. Okay, we put the lightning rod in the hole. Suddenly, the sky seems to be on fire as a bolt of pure lightning strikes the rod. Now, uh, you're startled to see a skeletal hand rise from a hole that is formed at your feet. Wow, look at that. Uh, so we're going to take whatever that guy's holding. And again, I, I just find the music in this. The, the music in this game is so creepy. But then for some reason in this scene, like, it's pretty upbeat. And, uh, you know, I was mentioning that there there were other uh, Mac Venture games. Uh, and I think there was maybe a total of four on the Mac. I think there was at least one game that didn't come to the NES. There were three of these games that came to the NES that all have this exact same... Uh, well, not exact same, but almost exact same interface. And the other two games are uh, Deja Vu, which I think is probably uh, as well known as Shadowgate is. And then there was one other game called Uninvited, which uh, is probably the, the least talked about one, I think. So we have to back out like nine screens now. Um, and Uninvited is kind of weird because it, it, it takes place in like a, a haunted house. But then like the music is like super perky. And it really doesn't fit in very well. Like, I think one of the defining features of Shadowgate is uh, is the music, at least in my opinion. Um, but, uh, keep going back. You have to open the door. Um, but in that game, like, the, the music seems very out of place. I always forget which way I'm supposed to go here. Hmm. Maybe it's this way, but I don't know. That's where the... Sorry, I don't know why. I always get... I always get confused right here. I don't know why. In here? Oh, no, that's the way I came. Sorry. We're looking for that screen that has the two... Um... Oh, yeah, it's this way. Uh, the two bridges here. So there are two bridges that span the chasm. So now, uh, so the deal is, is that the, the wickety, uh, wickety, the rickety uh, wooden bridge can't support our weight. But now uh, we have what we need so that we can uh, not weigh anything. 
Or do you want to use bottle number two? That's what I was saying. I think bottle number two is the only bottle you actually use in this game, if I remember correctly. Uh, you drink the liquid and immediately began to rise in the air. So, like, now we're weightless. So now we can go ahead and go across the rickety bridge, and now there's a giant snake. So that kind of sucks. But uh, if we use the wand... Where's the wand? There it is. We use the wand on the snake. Uh, we're going to transform the snake into something far more useful. Is it just your eyes, or is the snake shrinking? A uh, snake shrinks down. Some fire happens for some reason. And uh, now uh, we have a staff. So uh, that's good, because remember, we need uh, whatever it was called, the, the staff of whatever, uh, to... to beat the, the warlock guy at the very end. So uh, so now we're going to take the staff. And now we can leave. So now we have to go all the way back to where we were. It, it kind of sucks that it, it, the game makes you uh, backtrack so far just to come pick up this one thing. But now we're going to basically be leaving uh, this area for good. And actually, I mean, we're kind of... I don't know how, how long this recording is so far, but uh, uh, we're actually kind of getting towards... Uh, the end of the game now at this point. Yeah, yeah. So... So now, if we try to move, you see the, the troll's back. So, uh, you can pay a toll of one gold coin. Uh, I don't remember if you pay the toll, I don't know, maybe he murders you? I don't, I don't remember, because what you do instead is uh, you you use one of these spells and you like disappear. And I think that's the Humana spell. Don't we have a... Hold on, don't we have a scroll we didn't open yet? Yeah. Scroll 5. Observing the stars, the throne constellation appears once every summer. Legend says that it's a portal to another land. Uh, okay, I don't think that was a new spell. I think that was just another clue to the game, maybe. Uh, okay, so anyway, I'm pretty sure that we use the Humana spell here. Oh, yeah. Uh, you lose sight of yourself, and you're as invisible as the wind. So now you become invisible, so now you can just walk past the troll. Uh, now we're back in this little courtyard area with the Cyclops that we wasted. Uh, so now we just have to keep going back the way we came, um, where we were before. Now we go back through uh, the downstairs uh, door. Now we're in this this passageway again. Now we're going to go into the right side room. And now there's this crazy skeleton king dude. Uh, you're in a small throne room. A skeleton wearing a gold crown sits on a throne in front of you. And uh, remember that you have that scepter that you found. And I mean, who, who holds scepters? Uh, you know, uh, regents or whatever. Kings and queens. So, uh, obviously he has that big axe in one hand, but he has a free hand, and so we're going to use the scepter on him. So now he has that in his hand, and now this little door drops down. As soon as you give the scepter to the skeleton, the seal on the pillar lowers, and you can now see a ring-shaped hole. So that's probably one of the most obvious uh, clues that this game ever gives you. Like, obviously you have that ring that we found in the tree. And so we're gonna take that ring and we're gonna stick it. Ring fits perfectly. Uh, the throne magically rises, revealing a secret passageway. So now we have to go under the skeleton guy here uh, to go through the secret passageway. Uh, now the hallway's made of large granite slabs. Uh, so I think this is another cool way to die actually. So uh, let's save the game again real quick. Uh, Cause you see, obviously you can go straight but then uh, also there's this uh, little door off to the side. And I remember this being another sort of comical way to get killed. So if you try to go through that door, boom. Uh, this, uh, this thing, without thinking, you jump through the opening and immediately hear a loud click. Suddenly the granite slab above gives way and crushes you beneath it. It breaks every bone in your body. And so then here we got this guy back. Sad, the adventures have ended here doesn't matter now we just hit continue and uh, I, don't know, I just want to show you guys that so now we go up back under uh, him to get back into this room uh, and you'll notice that we have four uh, torches 
which we probably don't really need to grab because I don't know how many we had. We have nine torches, and we're almost done with the game, really. Um, but whatever. And then because we're gonna light one right now too, because uh, you can see that our lone torch over there is starting to look a little bit weak. And then we won't make the mistake of going through the side door again, so we're gonna move straight ahead. And uh, now we're in this room with these two big gigantic gargoyles uh, on these like high shelves or whatever. And uh, so we're not gonna go through there quite yet. We're gonna go take the side door over here. And uh, sulfurous fumes rise from the hot molten lava 30 feet below you. And there's this big gigantic crazy statue. Yeah, why would I swim through molten lava? Uh, and then here we have to use another spell. I think it's this Motari spell, right? The spell was chanted, Motari. The statue lowers and a large platform rises out of the lava. You now have a way across. Okay, so that's good. So now we can go ahead and move into the next room. And uh, so remember I told you uh, that we had to pay attention to that pattern, right? The thing that was like this and then like that and then like that, and then, you know, whatever. Uh, and and you see we have these three levers over here, and that's why you needed to see that that pattern. So I guess, like, you know, if you've been playing this game originally, you would just want, if you took meticulous notes, like, you know, when you see something like that pattern, uh, it's not just there for decoration. So, uh, so we have to lower this one, then lower the middle one, and then raise the first one again. There we go. Right handle was raised. Now you see this this thing lifts up here. It looks like a 55 gallon drum. That's kind of odd, but uh, uh, you're momentarily dazzled by the blind. Uh, the darkness is lit by a blinding flash. Uh, silver orb. So we're definitely going to need uh, that. So we take the silver orb, and um, you know one of the uh, clues that you get, I think, when you when you saw that wizard painting thing is uh, he's basically telling you how to put uh, the the Staff of Ages or whatever it was called together. So now we have all three components to make the staff. So we need to use the blade with the staff. Suddenly lightning begins to flash in the room. Uh, then the golden spike slides smoothly onto the staff and locks into place. So then we use the orb that we just got with the staff. Light cascades through the room. Staff becomes a living entity. So now, now we have what we need. So now we can go ahead and move out of here. Room so with lava. And now we're back in this room. Uh, it's a dark, gloomy cavern. And you know, I think it's telling you it's dark and gloomy. Maybe that's giving you like a little clue. Now, if you try to go through this door, uh, these these gargoyles are going to waste you. And actually, I don't remember what that looks like. So uh, let's go ahead and get wasted by the gargoyles just as I'm curious what that looks like. So suddenly the beasts begin to shudder and their eyes begin to glow red. Gargoyles angered at your presence spring from their frozen state and rip you to pieces. Very graphic. There's not enough left of you to even feed to the birds. Yikes. Okay, it's a sad thing, whatever. Okay, so we continue. Uh, now we're back in this room. So now we're gonna back out. So what are we gonna do uh, to get past these gargoyles? Where it's, well, it's a dark and gloomy cavern. So maybe if we can get these gargoyles uh, out of their comfort zone, we can distract them and move past them. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna use this uh, Illumina spell. Suddenly the cavern is so bright that you have to shade your eyes. It takes a few minutes for you to regain your senses from the Nova Burst. But the gargoyles are not recovering as quickly as you did. So now we can slip past them. And now we're just in this weird room uh, made solely for the purpose of housing the well. Uh, there's a door over here to the side, but you can't go through it. But uh, much like we did with the well out in the courtyard, we can manipulate the lever on this well. Cover of the well is open. And then we got that big coin out of the uh, uh, bag 
that was out on that lookout. We take the big coin, because, you know, what do you do with a big coin? You throw it in a well, like a wishing well, right? As soon as you throw the coin into the well, a huge wind erupts from within it. Uh, reminds you of the small dust devils you see in the autumn months. And now you can see on the little thingy down here, now you can actually move into the well. So we move down the well, and uh, now here's uh, seemingly another underground lake. And uh, you stand above a beach looking down upon... Okay, I'm sorry, it's a river. So, uh, I guess kind of like the river Styx, right? And you see we have this gong uh, over here. So if we take the little mallet on the gong and we use it on the gong itself... See, that's creepy. After the gong sounds, a specter materializes right before your eyes. He's on a raft. Uh, the ghostly ferryman doesn't look friendly. You hear a faint voice ask for a fare. So now we're going to use one of those normal gold coins that we found, and we're going to give it to the undead ferryman who gestures you to quickly board the raft. So now we're going to say move, and then we just have to click on the raft here. And he takes you across. Now you're here. You climb aboard the tiny raft and reach the opposite bank. A uh, stone skull stands against the far wall, screaming silently. So that's pretty creepy. For some reason, you get the feeling that you're standing on sacred ground. And then there was that little clue that you got uh, telling you... Oh, crap, we have to use a uh, uh, torch here real fast. Uh, we got that clue that was saying something about hanging a talisman on the wall, like where the uh, the sword is or whatever, like where the sword hangs. And that is referring to uh, this screen because you can see that there are three uh, talisman shaped holes in the wall and each has a little symbol over the top of it. And one of those symbols is a sword. So we want to put the talisman in the hole for the sword the artifact known as a bladed sun is now secured and in place. And then that same, uh, where we got that clue is where we got the clue that basically was telling you to play a horn as like the final key or whatever. So now we're going to use the horn. They didn't talk over it this time. Uh, the sound of the horn echoes loudly in your ears. Suddenly you hear the sound of grinding rock and the jaw of the skull begins to descend. Hot wind, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now the door's open, see? So uh, now we can move through that door. And now here's the warlock we've been looking for. Uh, the cavern you've entered is by far the largest your eyes have ever gazed upon. Some lightning happens. And uh, what ends up happening here? Oh my goodness, what is that? So uh, from the depths rises the most powerful creature that has ever existed, the behemoth. Your stomach knots up as you stare at this new horror. The beast is indeed incredible. You wonder for a moment how you can defeat such a creature as this. Well, you got the, 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 the hint already that you need to use the Staff of Ages to uh, defeat the behemoth here. So now we just have to scroll up and... Oh, the staff's right there. So I'm going to take the staff. What do you want to use the staff on? Well, it kind of tells you you're trying to defeat the behemoth, not defeat the, the warlock himself. So... We use the staff on the behemoth. You praise, you raise the staff of ages. That is the power that the prophets claimed. The staff pulsates with the power and a beam of light explodes from it, striking the behemoth. There you go. Bam. Behemoth uh, obviously is not doing well, but also happens to grab the uh, warlock as uh, he descends back down uh, into the gigantic chasm. Uh, creature screams in agony, thrashing back and forth in great pain. See, I kind of feel bad for the behemoth there because he's just an animal, you know? It's like when war horses get killed, you know? It wasn't a Nazi horse. It's just a horse. So anyway, uh, unfortunately, we had to murder the behemoth who was probably just minding his own business before the warlock showed up. But uh, thankfully, he grabs the warlock lord and descends into the depths uh, forever. Uh, you can hear the warlock lord screaming... Uh, fading into silence as they go down the chasm, I guess. Suddenly, it's very quiet. A beautiful light seems to fill the cavern. The morning sun, you say to yourself, it is over. So, although exhausted, you lean on the Staff of Ages and begin your long journey home. 
And uh, now all of a sudden, now you're back with the good guys. Words of your historic quest have already reached the farthest parts of the land. Like how? Who saw you do that? And is that king wearing sunglasses? Because uh, it looks like it. And uh, it says you're triumphantly greeted as you enter the gates of the royal city of Stormhaven. And uh, moments later, you're ushered into the royal palace where you're greeted by the king. I know what thou hast done, brave one. The world would be dark forever without thee. And then uh, I think you can't really click for a while. I think it's going to say some more things here in a minute. But, uh, you know, obviously now we've beaten the game. I don't know how long I was recording for, so uh, uh, I don't know how long that took us. But, um, oh yeah, here we go. You're bestowed a kingdom to rule and the king's fair daughter's hand. Well, that's a pretty good deal. As, uh, as you leave the throne room, you know that although this quest is over, others await. And so I don't know if that was like, uh, you know, I don't know if the developers knew that they were going to make more Shadowgate games. Uh, after all the bards will see, still need new legends to sing of and new tales to tell. So, you know, of course, uh, well, for those who don't know, there was a sequel to Shadowgate called Beyond Shadowgate on the uh, Turbo Graphics, actually, the Turbo CD. And then I don't remember the exact name of it, but there was like a Shadowgate 64 game uh, on the Nintendo 64. Uh, so it says the first story's end. So so that's the end now. So you can push the button all you want and uh, nothing's going to happen. So uh, that's the end of Shadowgate. Uh, for anybody who hasn't played through the game and wasn't planning on it, uh, now you got to see the whole game. So uh, I hope that's cool. Uh, I don't know how creepy that game looks by adult standards, but... Uh, you know, I think I've played through the games enough now that it no longer really creeps me out, but for a long time it did because I would play the game and it would kind of just take me back to uh, being a kid and how it felt playing it back then. So, uh, and hopefully, you know, sort of turning the lights down there maybe helped add to the ambiance. I don't really know. So, uh, uh, that's going to just about do it for this episode of Flashback. Uh, just fair warning, I'm not sure when the next episode is actually going to come out. Uh, just because, you know, I've been trying to get a couple of episodes done for the other channel. And quite frankly, I've just spending, been spending too much time working on this channel. Uh, just because it's fun and I like it. But I think that uh, making episodes for this channel should be more of like a little reward to me for getting one of the uh, getting an episode of the other channel done. But uh, too much, I've just been hanging out uh, over here. And uh, I do have another episode... Uh, for this channel that's like halfway done. So I'll try to work on that too because it'd be kind of nice because they're kind of related episodes. So it'd be kind of nice if I could have the next, well, not necessarily the next, but the episode that's currently half done for this channel come out at around the same time as the next episode of like, you know, proper classic gaming quarterly. So, uh, so I'll try to work to make that happen. But uh, anyway, if you actually manage to stick through uh, this whole episode, which I'm sure is well over an hour long, uh, then uh, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you guys again very soon.